All right, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in two different references today. The first one is in Luke chapter 14, and then also Luke chapter 9. So if you'll turn to Luke 14, uh, stick your bulletin or get one of the envelopes or something, stick it in there, mark your place, and then go to Luke chapter 9. We're going to be going back and forth between those two um, and doing a comparison. Now, this is not a continuation of the series on, on a God in search of a people. And this is not about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, but the idea carries across. And so just to refresh everybody's memory, God created humanity in order to bear his image. Remember, that's his personality, his purpose, his nature, his character. And he told humanity to go and fill the earth with his image. All right. Now, when mankind fell, it warped that image of God inside of him. And so when we multiplied, we, bared, we bore the other uh, images of other gods, whether it's ourself or society or uh, in, in ancient times, specific gods that they were trying to imitate and, and please and that kind of stuff, rather than bearing the God, the image of Yahweh. So then Jesus died so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could host the Holy Spirit inside of us as a temple, so that we could bear the image of God correctly. Because we don't, have a, we don't have a chance of imitating Him correctly without the Holy Spirit. But with the Holy Spirit, we can bear the image of God. We don't always, okay, we're not perfect, but we at least can now, okay, because the Holy Spirit's inside of us. And so now, it is our job as believers in Jesus, as sons of the King, as adopted heirs of Christ, it's our job to bear His image, spreading Eden, throughout the earth through God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, that was the summary of the last two sermons. And then when I got to the end of it, the question was, how? How does one bear the image of God? Now, I love to teach. God is a teacher. And so in that, I bear the image of God. But I taught drama <laughs> before I became a minister. Uh, that, not necessarily bearing the image of God. You see what I'm saying? Where, where my, and there wasn't anything wrong with that. God called me to teach, you know, and called me to teach drama and forensics and that kind of stuff. But, but even though my nature, my, my personality naturally bears some of the image of God, in order to bear the image of God correctly, I need to be doing something specific. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. This will take us into the new year more than likely. Um, I don't know how long it will take, but, um, but it'll take several weeks. And, uh, and so we have the Holy Spirit's power and the Holy Spirit's leading that allow us to bear His image correctly. But do you guys remember Jesus? He said, I don't say anything but what I hear from the Father. I don't do anything I don't see the Father doing. I mean, everything that Jesus did was a reflection of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so because of that, He bore the image of God Perfectly. That's why he could tell Thomas, if you see me, you see the Father. You know, the Father and I are one. You, you want to see the Father? Look at me, because he was following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, we need the power of God, because our flesh is too weak to follow the will of God in every situation. And we need the leading of God, because our flesh is still warped, and what we think is right isn't always right. I remember Proverbs it's in Proverbs somewhere. <laughs> there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. That word right there in that proverb means, means morally correct. You know, there's a way that seems moral to people, but it leads to death because, because our sense of right and wrong is warped. Why else would that person bomb the, um, the abortion clinic? You remember that story? Was that back in the 90s, I think, where someone went and bombed an abortion clinic trying to kill an abortion doctor? He felt that was right in his heart. But he was not right. He was wrong. And it led to death, quite literally. So, how do we do this? How do we get ourselves to the point where we can, more and more, reflect the nature and image and character and personality and life of Jesus? Well, we have a phrase for that. We call it maturity. <laughs> As you mature in Christ, you look more and more like Jesus. I'm not talking about beard and, you know, unshaven sides of the hair and, you know, walking around in robes. I'm talking about the personality, the character, the nature of Jesus. And you will never get there perfectly, 
until you no longer have this broken flesh, and you're not going to reflect the nature of Jesus in its entirety. That needs to be clear as well, because everyone has their gift. You know, I'm going to reflect Jesus a little bit differently than you do, and that's by design, because everybody is unique. And so when you reflect Christ, it's going to reach certain people that I would not be able to reach. You see what I'm saying? You know, I, I knew a guy who was a um, part of the Christian Motorcyclist Association, and he would go to Sturgis and witness to bikers. And we were talking about it, and he said, you ought to come with me, because I, I had just gotten my motorcycle license. I said, are you kidding me? They would beat me up at Sturgis. Say, Who's that nerd, you know, and go after me? I could just see it happening right now. Because there's people I probably can't reach. And that's okay, because there's people that this other guy can't reach. They'd take one look at him and see all his tattoos and go, Psh, he doesn't know nothing. You know, so, so we all reflect Jesus a little bit differently because we reflect a portion of his personality, a portion of his nature to the world. Yes? Oh, sorry. I had to turn the lights off. <laughs> I forgot about that. The Christmas lights freak the camera's autofocus out, and it can't tell whether it's supposed to be focused on them or me, and so it just does this. Is that better? Okay, all right. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for letting me know. I, I told, I, Kay asked me about it, and I remembered, and then I just forgot. So, so we have another phrase for this as well. The, the desire to reflect the nature of Jesus, we call that a disciple of Jesus. And that's going to be our subject for the next several weeks. What does it mean to be a disciple, and how do you behave like a disciple? And today what we're going to do is look at what a disciple actually is. If you look at the Greek word for disciple in the, uh, in the New Testament, it's the Greek word mathetis, or mathetis, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, where the emphasis goes. But it means one who thinks. Isn't that great? Did you know math, by the way, it is a Greek word, means to think or process? That's why I was so bad at it. Uh, now, mathetis, or however you pronounce that, is one who thinks, a person who processes, who uses his brain. And so it's kind of a generic term for someone who likes to learn, someone we might call them a philosopher today, which of course is another Greek word. But we need to look at the original Hebrew meaning because Jesus, when he would say, you know, if you want to be my disciple, in the Bible it's written mathetis. How do you pronounce it? Mathetis, yeah. That's how it's written because it's in Greek. But Jesus didn't speak Greek, or at least he wasn't preaching in Greek. He was preaching either in Hebrew or Aramaic. And in Hebrew and Aramaic, they have a different word. For disciple, it is Talmud. Now, Talmud is found only once in the Old Testament. And it is a concept that developed in the intertestinal period. Okay? This is a word that, that developed its meaning between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when Jesus shows up on the scene and he gets disciples, that idea is not found very commonly in the Old Testament because it was something that the, the Jews had developed, especially during the um, Babylonian captivity. When they couldn't go to the temple, they began to rely more and more heavy on rabbis, and that continues on to today. Okay? So you would have a rabbi, which is a teacher, and then you would have a talmit, which is a disciple. Okay? And so we want to look at this intertestinal concept. What does Talmud mean? Well, the word Talmud comes from the Hebrew word Limud. Don't ask me why. Apparently, it does. And Limud, or Limud, is a learned or experienced or discipled person. So a Talmud is a person who has been trained, someone who is learned, someone who is experienced, and someone who has been discipled. So let's look and see what that meant, what this concept of disciple meant in Jesus' day. It's actually pretty foreign to us, and, and the farther I get into this, you're going you're to realize what I mean. I mean, we, we live in a free society, right? We live in an independent society where we are beholden to no one. Even our government is of the people. So our government is even beholden to us as citizens. That idea is very contrary to the concept of a disciple. So let me go through what they meant when they talked about a disciple. A Talmud or disciple chose willingly to submit to a rabbi as a learner. 
okay? And this was a total submission. And the rabbi had to accept the Talmud as his disciple. And a lot of people were not accepted. And so what would happen is you would have, a, like, let's say the rabbi gets more and more popular, like Gamaliel is probably the one we know the most because he's referred to in scripture several times. He was a very famous rabbi. He's even mentioned in um, Josephus' works. And so this Gamaliel had a lot of people who wanted to be his disciple. And he would only pick some that he would choose for his disciples. He would say, you could be my disciple. No, not you. You could be my disciple. And we don't know, you know, what his reasoning was. It could be, uh, you know, favors for friends, or it could be, you know, you're not serious enough, and you've got too much garbage in your life, and, you know, and you're, the, you're serious, so you can be my disciple. But each rabbi would choose disciples, and the disciples would uh, offer themselves as a uh, Talmud to the rabbi. So the Talmud believes the rabbi's interpretation of Scripture. That's the key interaction between rabbi and disciple. It was a belief, or we could say a submission, to their interpretation of the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. And because the Word of God guided all of their lives, the rabbi's interpretation of it then guided their entire lives. That's why it was a total submission. Because really what they were doing is they would go to the, tel- or go to the, dis- the rabbi and, and learn the rabbi's interpretation of Scripture. And then that would guide their entire life. Because, you know, the the, the Old Testament says don't work on Saturdays. But then, well, what if if I need to water my animals? Can I do that? You know, what if there's a fire in my house? Can I put it out? You know, the the real-world application of what the Bible says, that's the discussion between the rabbi and the Talmud, was this, this, how do I apply Scripture to my daily life? And so the rabbi would interpret Scripture, and the Talmud would believe the rabbi's interpretation. Now, in Hebrew, belief is not a mental ascent. Like, I can believe that, uh, I don't know, what's something I can believe? I can believe in gravity. I'm having, I must be really tired this morning. I'm having trouble coming up with examples. I can believe in gravity, but that doesn't mean that I have to submit to it in my action. I do, of course, because you can't supersede gravity. But I can go out and, and jump around and do whatever I want and, and overcome gravity with flight or rockets or whatever, even though I believe gravity is a, is a legitimate law. Okay, And, and I can believe in... Um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, altruism, okay, where, where it's important to take care of the needs of others. But that doesn't mean I'm going to have to do it. You know, I can believe in utilitarianism, the most good for the most people for the longest period of time, but that doesn't mean that I have to live that way. You see what I'm saying? Just because I believe something is true doesn't mean I have to live by it in, according to our understanding of belief, because belief is just up here for Westerners. For Easterners, belief is not here, it's here. That's why the, the Bible says it is with the heart man believes. It doesn't say with the mind. There's a reason for that. Because in ancient Eastern re, uh, 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 cultures, a belief was so that it motivated and prompted response. Kind of like when you believe there's a bear outside your cabin and it motivates you to do or not do certain things and it turns out it's just a mouse in the attic. <laughs> Did I tell you guys that story? No, I'll tell it to you later. It's funny. I thought there was a bear outside the cabin, and it turned out it was just a mouse, but it sounded like a bear bumping around outside the cabin. So I did not go outside because I believed that there was a bear out there, even though it was just a mouse in the attic. You see what I'm saying? So belief changes behavior. And so when the disciple, when the Talmud listened to the rabbi, he would then change his behavior according to the belief that the rabbi explained to him. You guys following me? This is important. I know it's like, what does this have to, it's important. I'll bring it, I'll bring it to, bring it to a head here in a minute. Now, what they would do is they would have conversations called yeshivas. And a yeshiva was a a discussion about a life application process. Okay. The rabbi would ask a question or one of the students would ask a question. They would converse, you know, uh, okay, well, it's, how do I, what circumstances is is it okay for me to divorce my wife? That's a good example, okay? And they would have a discussion. And then eventually the rabbi would say, this is my conclusion. And when the rabbi said, this is my conclusion, that ended the discussion. The yeshiva was over. 
Now, that's the truth, and the disciple had to accept it or stop being the rabbi's disciple. You catch that? The disciple, the tal Talmud, has to accept the rabbi's decision or stop being the rabbi's disciple. Now, this rabbinic Talmudic relationship was very transparent. You know, we look at a teacher student relationship like in a classroom. I would see the students, you know, for an hour, a day, or whatever, and then that was it. You know, I didn't go home with them. I didn't know their parents. I didn't ask them about their personal life. But in a, 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 a rabbi was expected to get into the business of the Talmud. He was supposed to know what was going on in his life. And he would ask him a very important and potent question. Why did you do X, Y, and Z? The rabbi would watch the Talmud's behavior, and then he would, he would ask him, why did you do that? And then the Talmud would have to answer, and they would discuss, yeshiva, they would discuss this, whether or not that was right or wrong. It was a very transparent relationship. And this, this constant transparency led to a daily evaluation of the behaviors and beliefs of, between the rabbi and the Talmud, so that eventually this Talmud, this disciple, this learner, would understand the rabbi's will so much that when the rabbi died, the Talmud could take over as rabbi and then he could explain the rabbi's belief to the next generation. But you don't get that type of understanding, that place where you can replace a person unless you're really close with them. You spend a lot of time together. You see what I'm saying? And there would be that one disciple that would take over for the rabbi. Now this process trained the rabbi in the, in the or trained the Talmud in the rabbi's belief but it also trained the Talmud in discernment because after the rabbi passes away, he's, their new questions are going to show up. And the Talmud has to be able, the, the new rabbi would have to be able to determine what would my old rabbi say about this. And that's only possible if he really knew the rabbi. Now, does that sound familiar? What would Jesus do? <laughs> As a very legitimate question for disciples of Jesus because that's our job as Talmids of Jesus, or Talmidin, I'm not sure how you pluralize Hebrew, but you know, as disciples of Jesus, we should be able to answer that question, what would Jesus do? And so this is the process of discipling a Talmid in order to replace his teacher after the teacher left. Now, if you've got your Bible, go to Luke chapter 14, and then go to verse 25. We're going to read this. And then we're going to go back and forth between that and Luke chapter 9. It's almost Luke chapter 10. It's Luke chapter 9, verse 59 is where we're going to be in that one. So, All right, so let's read uh, 25 through 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't, the first, or won't he sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I want to point out something. The very end there, he, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear, is is a, uh, it's like a code phrase. It means this is going to be difficult to understand. You need discernment to figure this out. So we look at this and we just go, ah, that was cool. We're going to miss something. Because if you go back to verse 25, it says, large crowds traveled with Jesus. And we would, we would look at them and say, it was a large crowd of disciples. No, it was a crowd. Notice they're not called disciples. And Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to be my disciple, my Talmud, then think about this. So this crowd are not disciples because anyone can just follow Jesus around waiting to see another miracle. 
There are Christians today that, well, there are people today, I don't know whether they're Christians or not, but there are people today that'll go from event to event to event to see miracles, but never really become a disciple, a Talmud of Jesus. Because the Talmud is different. Let's look at what Jesus has to say about it. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me, that's to be a disciple, okay, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So Jesus says, look, if you want to be my Talmud, okay, but you have to be willing to leave your entire family behind. If they're not going to go with you, then they get left behind. You have to put me before your family. Now that to us sounds a little harsh, but actually that wasn't that uncommon. Because, you know, if I lived in Galilee, in Nazareth, and the rabbi lived in Jericho, I would have to go where the rabbi was. He's not going to come move in with me. Well, they didn't have Skype, so you had to go where the rabbi was. So to be a Talmud, to be a disciple, you often had to leave family. But notice he doesn't just say leave them. He says if they do not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Now, of course, this, this isn't literally saying you have to hate your family. Okay, some of you are like, I already hate my family. I got that down. No, that's not what he means, okay? This is a comparative, all right? It's like saying, you have to be so on fire for me that, you, that your relationship with your family looks cold by comparison. See what I'm saying? It's kind of like 50 degrees feels pretty warm in February and really cold in, Jan in July because, that's, because it's comparative, okay? So you don't hate your family, but your love for Jesus is so strong that your family takes such a back seat that it looks like you hate them. And then he continues in, the, in verse 26, yes, even their own life. So you not only have to hate other people in comparison, yourself as well. Now that's hard. But think about the Talmudic, uh, Talmudic and rabbinic relationship. When the, when the rabbi says, this is the truth, I have to accept it, whether I like it or not. When the rabbi says, this is how behavior must be done, I have to accept it, whether I like it or not. So this isn't a shock, because you would have to give up your own life and hate your own desires and wishes in comparison to your love for the rabbi's desires and wishes. So when the rabbi says, you can't do this, you yourself Tell your own flesh, I don't want that anymore. Because the rabbi says, no. You guys following me on that? Okay. But then he continues. This is where it gets hairy. Verse 27. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. There's a difference between loving your life or hating your life and carrying your cross. Hating your life is where you, you give in to the wishes of the other rather than your own. Carrying your cross is the willingness to die. And so he, you know, that was pretty uncommon. It wasn't very often disciples of rabbis had to be crucified with their rabbi, okay? And yet in here, this is what we see. He says, you have to be willing to take up your cross daily to follow me. Now go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Uh, verse, what did I say, 59? Let's read this whole section. You go to 57. As they were walking along the road, the man, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Be your disciple. Then Jesus replied, Foxes and have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. So Jesus is calling this man to be a disciple. But he replied, First let me go and bury my father. Then Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So we see a reflection of the same concept, hating father and mother, brothers and sisters, husband and wife, whatever it is. This goes to uh, verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of God fit for service in the kingdom of God. You have to have a specific break where I am now devoted to my rabbi rather than to my family. Now, we do know that we have a responsibility to, to, to take care of our family. We're not allowed to leave our family, 
and wander off someplace else. There was a young man, well, young, I think he was my age, but uh, who told his family, if you're not, if you're not going to come with me, God's called me to Hoxie. If you're not going to come with me, then you can just stay where you are and we're done. And uh, a friend of mine was chatting with him and said, that's not okay. <laughs> you have to take care of your family. And he's like, well, it says that, you know, I've, I can't look back. He's like, that's not what it means. Because remember, this is comparative. I'm not willing to say, Lord, I will be your disciple. I will be your Talmud. And then my family says, no, you won't. Oh, okay, I won't. And then turn back to them. Now, I still take care of them, but I have to obey God above my family. Turns out the young man had a psychotic break. It was a <laughs> different issue altogether. But, uh, okay, go back to Luke 14. This is going to be really annoying with this. I should have figured out how to trick it to do what I wanted. Okay, Luke 14. So we've got family, life, and carrying your cross. Okay? Now go down to, uh, is it 28? Yeah, well, that entire section, 28 through 33, we see Jesus saying, consider what it's going to cost. Don't just say, I'll follow Jesus. He said, think about it. And then we see some of that examples in Luke chapter 9 where he tells them, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Sometimes being a disciple of Jesus is going to put you in a position of uncomfortableness. It's going to put you in a place where you don't have everything you think you should have. Because following Jesus is expensive, not necessarily financially, although it can be. But it can also be very expensive in what you have to give up. Because I remember talking to a fella and he said, I, I don't watch rated R movies. And I said, oh, okay, why is that? He said, because God told me to stop. I said, was that hard for you? He said, oh, yeah. He wasn't into like central movies, but he really loved horror movies. That was one of his favorite things. And God said, you have to give that up. That was really hard for him because he loved those things. I don't personally get it, but <laughs> he really enjoyed them. And so there is a cost to being a disciple because your life is no longer your own. Consider that cost. Not only that, but sometimes being a disciple isn't going to be fun. God's going to say, I want you to do this, and you're not going to want to. Sometimes being a disciple is going to be met with persecution, where you're doing the right thing and people hate you for it. And that's not fun either. But it happens. And they go to verse 33. Uh, Luke 14, verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. A disciple goes all in, leaves everything behind. There's no turning back. Now, why is that? Why is that so important? Because you're supposed to replace the rabbi. And you say, well, I can't replace Jesus. Really? What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. And then what did he say after that? You're the light of the world. I have been sent to preach the kingdom of God. You have been sent to preach the kingdom of God. I have been sent to heal and deliver people of demons. Go and heal and deliver people of demons. What Jesus did, he said, you will do the same things and even greater things in my name because I go to the Father. We are Jesus' replacement. Sounds like a bad deal to me, honestly. I think Jesus is getting ripped off, but it was his choice. So he chose us. To replace him, we, the Talmud, should be close enough to Jesus to the point where we can reflect his nature and character to other people and be able to discern what his will is. Now, if that sounds impossible, it is. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is there to fill that gap. When you say, you know, what would Jesus do? Don't think about it. Pray about it. Jesus, what would you have me do in the situation? And follow what you think you hear. Because only through that will you truly reflect the nature of God. But that does not mean that we don't need this close, personal, open relationship with Jesus. We do. Because through that, we learn discernment. Not just how to hear the Spirit, but also how to understand. You know, the, the longer I go in my faith and the longer I listen to the Holy Spirit, something odd is happening. God gives me less and less instruction. And it kind of creeped me out in the beginning. And I was like, Jesus, this is not okay. I need to know what you think about these things. Then he said something to me. He said, you need to learn how to figure this stuff out for yourself. 
you need to be able to reflect me naturally, not just a word from God every time. Now, he wants to talk to me all the time. I'm not saying God doesn't want to speak to us, but he wants us to mature as well. He doesn't want us just to stay babies saying, Daddy, what do I do? He wants us to stay children and looking to Daddy. But there are times when God says, Micah, you do what you think is best. I don't like that. I like having a boss, right? And some of you are like, no, I do. I don't want to be the one that makes the decisions. I want God to tell me. But I, as a Talmud, as a disciple, have to get to the point where God can, where, where I can see the circumstance and discern this is what Jesus would do. And trust that if I make the wrong decision, he'll warn me. And I've had to do that several times in the last couple of, well, last year probably. It has been very uncomfortable, but it has always turned out good. <laughs> okay, that's not true. There's one time it turned out bad. Uh, but I, but I, I, knew, I knew I'd made the wrong choice <laughs> after I made it. Anyway, all right. So here's what we're going to do. Next week, we're going to take a look at the Scripture and see how it describes Jesus' behavior and how we as Talmids should reflect that. But today I want you to understand your relationship with Jesus. If he's the rabbi and you're the Talmud, everything he says goes. Everything he does, you're supposed to reflect. Everything he believes, you believe. And you imitate him in your life. That's a disciple of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength and the wisdom and the leading to be your disciples. Father, we are weak people and we, we get distracted very easily by the things of this life. But help us to know your will, to get close enough to you to know how you would behave and what you would decide, that we can be the, the light of the world. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.